Welcome, fantastic friends, to the new episode of the Fancast at Four podcast, the number one Fantastic Four fan casting podcast on the internet. Presumably. Even probably. I'm Dan Bettenhausen. And I'm Jack Mayer. And we are your hosts as we venture into the what ifs of Marvel's first family will be appearing in phase six of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. With Matt Shackman set to direct the MCU's Fantastic Four film, we still can explore what it would be like if a different director was behind the camera and who they might cast. Jack and I are very excited for the director we are discussing this episode. He's an American British screenwriter, composer, musician, director, actor, and comedian. And he is most known for having written, directed, and starred in many mockumentary style films. Many scenes and character backgrounds in his films are written and directed. However, actors rarely have rehearsal time and are allowed to improvise many scenes. This director is also married to actor Jamie Lee Curtis. This week, we are featuring Christopher Guest. Jack, what comes to mind when you think of Christopher Guest? It is that mockumentary style, really. Uh, he, I think, almost reinvented the genre with his films that he's made. Um, obviously, many people believe Spinal Tap to kind of be this impetus, which he does star in, but he did not actually direct. Rob Reiner, I believe. It was, Yes. What I so love about his films is it takes these facets of society, these kind of, I don't want to say unsung elements, but just this the stuff that you don't, that doesn't get glorified, I guess, and teases them, but also puts a lot of heart into what he's fake documenting. He also just has a very, very funny ensemble that he tends to work with. Right, exactly. You'll see... Probably in our casts, a lot of the same same people, but just from movie to movie, you will see 10 plus actors that are just a thread throughout all of his films. And what's so amazing about these comedic geniuses is they're all playing different characters. Rarely, rarely are you seeing someone play the same person. And we had talked about the improvisation that's on his sets. Apparently, one of his films had a cut that was... 80 hours long because of all the improvisation that they did it would be so incredible i think to be able to just go and see all the different takes and tries that and things that didn't make it that were still hilarious that all these great actors and actresses attempted it shocks me how good these people are at not breaking because if i was sitting on that set with those people i would have my face covered in my hands just trying not to giggle and ruin a take no kidding. And I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of that, too. But what you get on screen is comedy gold. Well, I think that's a great segue into our first segment, Four Fantastic Films. Here we will discuss four films by Christopher Guest. For the first one, we are actually going to kind of jump around in time a little bit to one of his more recent, which is strange because this one's a film from 2006. And that is For Your Consideration. We've considered it. Moving on now to his first directorial mockumentary, and that is 1996's Waiting for Guffman. Jack, I know this is a favorite of yours. It is one of my favorite movies. I've seen this movie 10 times at least. I think that this movie is incredible incredibly funny it nails so much about community theater uh as someone who participated in community theater for years and years and years of my life it is kind of scary how right they get it <laughs> yeah this this is a movie i certainly haven't watched enough i wa rewatched it this weekend prior to our recording and I'm, I'm one i'm glad i did because it's, it's hilarious but two it is just kind of the start of what you're going to get with these other movies we're going to talk about and for jack it may be the peak of it for me it's kind of the ground up for some of it's actually not the peak and i think that's oh, really almost oh, i really? think that's what i like so much about christopher guess is that Wonderful. he can make movies where i'm just like yeah that's probably one of the funniest comedies i've ever seen it's not even my favorite of his movies one of my favorite scenes in Waiting for Guffman is when Christopher Guest is the lead. He goes and he's directing 
this community community production of the town's founding, Blaine, Missouri, and their red, founding. white, and Blaine, <laughs> as it is called, I believe. And he goes to the city council to ask for some funding for the play, and he asks for one hundred thousand dollars to put on this play. And they think he's joking. Like, he put on plays in the town before. So, like, they know what he's been able to do. And it's like, wait, you're serious. And just the interplay between his seriousness, everyone making fun of him, and his just rage quitting. I was Bastard on people. That's what you are. <laughs> you're bastard people. <laughs> it's so good. But again, and I think this is also where we see the first use of that Christopher Guest ensemble because we have Eugene Levy as Dr. Alan Pearl oh, yeah. uh, who's so funny uh, Catherine O'Hara and Fred Willard together as like the married couple who's the lead in all the shows right and yeah I'm glad you brought up Fred Willard because unfortunately he had passed away watching all these movies back man we, we lost a comedy treasure he is such a singular talent like and again, again, it's all in his delivery. It is so, so brilliant, uh, especially in Guffman. But um, we'll talk about another right, one that is in right. that is again my personal favorite performance in a Christopher Guest movie. It's just the ability to be so condescending in this movie, but also <laughs> so funny. It hits the nail on the head there for sure. Uh, Parker Posey, I think, honestly steals Guffman for me. Uh, her singing Teacher's Pet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, such a good scene. It's so fun. Like, I'm just, I, again, I keep repeating it, yeah. but I just can't think of a better way to describe it. It is just pure comedy. And you have her starting off introducing herself at her job at the Dairy Queen. And she was excited about where, after the show's over, she's excited about where her life might go. And then her dad's released from prison, and she ends up at a different Dairy Queen in Alabama. And, like, mm -hmm. she seems content, but, like, it is so depressing. But she it's somehow really sad. makes it very funny. I mean, and that's, again, he knows how to take all these same actors and find the nugget of gold in mm -hmm. all of their performances. And then Michael McKean as well, I just have to touch on, because again, oh, yeah. a fantastic performance, but a, also a fantastic character yep. of just this person who loves Corky St. Clair, who is the director played by Christopher Guest, right. who just is like, adores everything he's done in the town and is so mad that he can't audition for the show <laughs> because it's on a day when he has to work and Corky won't allow him to audition another time. But then the fact that Corky will just go and offer a part to someone else is so, so funny. Him in the audience, like, screaming for Corky, <laughs> I think is just so brilliant. And it's also, like, weirdly good lgbtq representation for the yeah. time yeah Which, like i yeah. really like the ways that they play with Corky's sexuality and the way that they they don't ever mock his sexuality but they make jokes surrounding it and they're surrounding yes. the way that people don't necessarily realize that Corky is not straight and i think it walks a fine tightrope between playing up the stereotype and for lack of a better term mocking it like being mean about it mm -hmm. and i think it he does a good job of not not tipping over on the wrong side of that type rope i agree well let's move on to the next film and that is a film four years later best in show released in the year 2000 jack what do you think about best in show this is the one for me this was the first christopher yes directed movie that i saw yeah my parents showed it to me uh, one night because they were like, we think you should watch this. We think you'll really like it. I wasn't sure what to expect from the first couple minutes because it's just Parker Posey and Michael McKean in therapy. <laughs> and then it pans over to their dog sitting there. And that was what I knew exactly what I was getting. And I was in right there i think that this has the best characters in a christopher guest movie i think it has some of the 
I think it has the best conceit of a Christopher Guest movie. I think that everybody is at the top of their game here. It's the first time that we get the pairing of Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara, which I think really works to the movie's benefit. Because the two of them together in their first talking head, when she is talking about the fact that she's had hundreds of men, and he's like, oh, I did not know that. Is it them singing all the songs about terriers? God loves a terrier. <laughs> uh, him saying, no, I've got two left feet. And then he's not literally, joking. Literally has two literally left feet. Literally has two left feet. <laughs> it is so funny. Oh, I man. just, I love everything about this movie. I have, again, for the number of times that I've watched Guffman, I probably watched Best in Show twice as much. I could probably quote about half of this movie. I yeah. love it dearly. This movie, I I agree with you in a sense that I think the performances and just the straight comedy you get from this movie is guessed at his best. The last movie we're going to talk about is my personal favorite. But just from a straight laughs standpoint, this is incomparable. Mm -hmm. Uh, The And again, it's just this slice, this dog show, not glorified. Like there aren't Oscar movies about the... Uh, Westminster Kennel Club or anything like, or the dog shows like there, which, you know, maybe there should be. Maybe there should be. The, just the slice of life from these strange characters. And again, you have uh, John Michael Higgins and Michael McKeon, another LGBTQ role. I think towing that line between teasing the stereotype, but not, not mocking it. Oh, I, I messed up earlier. I'm just realizing oh. uh, it's not Michael McKean. That's the person who says words. It's Michael Hitchcock. Oh, there you're Guffman. right. Yeah. But again, and it's Michael Hitchcock, who's Parker Posey's uh, right. husband right. in this movie, who met her at uh, Starbucks, uh, <laughs> but not the same Starbucks. They were at Starbucks's across the street from one another. Well, and they, I mean, obsessed with their LL Bean catalogs. Mm-hmm. And uh, don't, for, oh, don't forget the Busy Bee. Oh, God. Busy Bee uh, is something that my, is like now a cultural staple of my family. <laughs> Uh, we got our dog a busy bee, you know, that, that whole scene where she's in the pet store and is like demanding to find a bee. Well, this is kind of like a bee. That's, that's a fish. That's a fish. <laughs> but it's just got the yellow and the black. Into a dog, he won't, you know, he won't know. It's... This is also the movie with my favorite Fred Willard performance because he yes. plays one of the dog show announcers. Right. And he just has some of the most brilliant one-liners that I cannot imagine were written for him. But the fact that, like, you can just think up... So the the, the dog show that they go to is the Mayflower dog show. Right. And the fact that he just thought up, you know, I, I've heard that uh, Christopher Columbus did not actually sail on the Mayflower <laughs> when he was in America. So, I think broke me the first time I watched it. Fred Willard and Jim Piddick as the commentators of the dog show ran so Gary Cole and Jason Bateman could fly in dodgeball. They are the precursor to the hilarious comment duo commentators, like in some regards, very similar, yet very different. And I mean, I love both sets of performances, Mm -hmm. but the hilarity versus the straight man that you have between Fred Willard and Jim Piddick is just so damn good. This movie also introduces two new players in the Christopher Guest catalog who are Jennifer Coolidge and Jane Lynch, who are both, again, phenomenal in this movie. Right. Yeah, and they they take a bigger – well, this is a bigger role for Jennifer Coolidge in this movie compared to the next one we're going to talk about. But this is easily one of my favorite performances she's ever done in this role. You know, uh, my relationship with Leslie is very physical. (laughs) So good. This old both, man that she's married to. We both like soup and bags of peas. <laughs> uh, Christopher guests Harlan Pepper. Oh, yeah. Uh, being like able to name every kind of nut. Cashew nuts, peanut, Brazil nut. nut. <laughs> Macadamia nut. Don't for, remember, pine nut is also the name of the name town. Of the town. <laughs> Pistachio nut, red pistachio nut. Natural, all natural white pistachio nut. Do you remember which nut was the one that got his mother all riled up? Was it macadamia nut? It was macadamia nut. 
we could keep talking about this movie so much, but you know, I'm going to be greedy and want to move on to this last one. My personal favorite, the 2003 film, A Mighty Wind. This movie is in my top 10, and I know I'm an outlier for a lot of people, but this movie, I think, has the biggest balance of comedy and heart between his movies. I think his first two lean very heavily into the comedy, where this one, I think, has a little bit more emotion behind it. Not saying the others don't have their moments, but I think this leans more into the emotion than the previous two we talked about, and the soundtrack is just killer. If you haven't listened to the soundtrack and you have any sort of interest in folk music, even if it's just a tiny bit, totally worth it. I memorize, I have like four or five songs memorized. I listen to it regularly. So good. Even though Guffman is considered the musical one of the Christopher Guest films, I would say that this one does by far have the best music. The music in Guffman, I think, is played to comedy, where this is legit music. You have Michael McKeon, who wrote a lot of the music, along with his wife, I believe. And guest, I believe, also. Yes, and guest, guest, right, right. And what I think what I like about this is this movie is a little more refined, isn't the right word, but focused in that you have three kind of main groups of singers rather than all these different dog showers. So mm-hmm. I think it kind of centralizes the stories into fewer. So you can learn about these, these characters more who are about to present this, uh, folk review in honor of a recently deceased producer of theirs. And you have the you have the Main Street singers, or the, the new Main Street singers. You have the folksmen, who are Michael McKean, Christopher Guest, and Harry Shearer. Harry Shearer. Harry Shearer. And then you have Mitch and Mickey, played by uh, Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara. All of them are great, but I'm, gonna, I'm starting to ramble. So, Jack, I'm going to yeah. let you talk about it a well, little bit. I actually saw this movie for the first time yesterday, as Dan knows. Uh, <laughs> I hadn't seen it before, uh, even though I'd always wanted to, but it was just, it was so, it's so well done. This is also, I think this is my favorite Bob Balaban performance in a Christopher Guest movie as Jonathan Steinblum. He is so, so good. Uh, So is this the rehearsal furniture or the furniture that's actually going to be used when they're all on set? Well, it's not furniture, it's a set. And yes, (laughs) it's it's designed so it looks 3D, but it's flat. Um, I'll keep, I keep, I can... No, you you right. this is this is your movie, Dad. I will I will let you talk about this as long as you would oh, like. Man. Uh I, I want people to keep listening. <laughs> <laughs> um but really all of these movies, you you should check them out. They're all absolutely worth the time. And they're all short as well. Right. Not none of them are above 90 minutes. And I want to kind of go back to we touched on a little bit the relationship between Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara. I think that's really what makes these movies successful is because in looking at Best in Show and A Mighty Win, they are the heart of these films. They are the mm-hmm. emotional beat and the ones we're really rooting for, I think, in both of these films. Particularly everyone- A Mighty Wind, I would say. Because, yeah. uh, again, Eugene Levitt plays this like ridiculous character, but you feel for him. Oh, 100%. And... While this is very much an ensemble movie, and I wouldn't say anyone's the lead, despite not being the lead, they're the heart of Mm -hmm. the movie. And that bleeds over into something like Schitt's Creek and why that show was so successful. And the ensemble you have between them, Dan Levy, Annie Murphy, works because those two, those, those experienced actors, those experienced comedy geniuses know how to do it. And it comes from years and years of of work and working together. And I'm re- I started rewatching Shit's Creek in preparation for this, and just all so good. It's so so good. Yeah. If if you need some song recommendations from this movie, "Kiss at the End of the Rainbow" is a number one. The t- titular song "A Mighty Wind" is very good. It's oh, I love 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 the titular song. It's so so good. Old Joe's Place is a fun one. And then one that didn't make the cut from the movie, except for a scene where they're rehearsing, it's called When You're Next to Me. All very good. Mm -hmm. The one thing where we were kind of giving Guest his flowers on representation in the films, I am not so sure the Harry Shearer uh, trans character really worked for me. Yeah, it doesn't hold up. I don't think Uh... it's so offensive. And again, this is a cis white by guy talking here, you know? I don't think it's so offensive, but it's it just feels a little off 
now. Yeah, it feels very out of place from the rest of the movie. It seems it seems like it's making fun, but I don't think it's doing it mean spiritedly. Mm-hmm. But it yeah, compared to the other two movies we talked about with with LGBTQ representation in it, this one missed the mark a little bit. So that's my really my one knock on the film. But it is still excellent, and I think you should yes. check it out. Yes, and that it's one moment that really hap- that happens near the end. It's not a thread throughout the whole film. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if you also want to see where Jared Leto's inspiration for Paolo <laughs> Gucci came from, look at Christopher Guest in this movie. I noticed it immediately, and I couldn't unsee it. Yeah, you for messaged, the entire film. You messaged me, and that's all I see now. So thank you. <laughs> But I could keep talking about A Mighty Wind, and we could keep talking about these films for a while, but I do think it's time to get into our castings. So here, each of us will cast a Reed Richards, a Sue Storm, Johnny Storm, Ben Grimm, and Dr. Doom with an actor or actress Christopher Guest has worked with previously and has not had a major MC role. So with that said, Jack, take it away with your fantastic forecast. So I kind of have to say my Reed and my Sue together because my Reed and Sue are Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara. Like Dan said, they are the heart of nearly every Christopher Guest film. Reed and Sue's relationship is going to be the heart of this film. Uh, They work so well together and they are so funny together that I feel like not having them be the power couple of Marvel's first family would almost be a disservice. As my Johnny Storm... There were a multitude of actors I could have chosen for this role. Uh, But I ultimately went with John Michael Higgins, who I think just delivers some phenomenal work, especially in A Mighty Wind, was where he really stuck out to me in Christopher Guest films. But I think he could bring the comedy and the diva-ness of Johnny Storm. Uh, And again, especially where I want to go in my pitch. Uh, As my Ben Grimm, uh, this will make sense in the pitch but i thought of this joke for the pitch and i realized i couldn't not use it so my ben grim slash really the thing is jennifer coolidge yes and i will explain why in the pitch and then my doctor doom is christopher guest himself again it will make sense as to why in the pitch but i feel like you know Guest is great in everything that he does. So, like, why not have him be the villain? He really is a chameleon. I mean, between all three of his characters in the movies we talk in depth, all extremely different, all different accents. Like, he can do, I I believe he could be Doom. And I am a little jealous that I let you pick first because, of course, I mean, of course, Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara have to be the leads. They're not in mine. John Michael Higgins inspired casting. You'll get to take off the Dickies when you earn the opportunity to take off the Dickies. And yeah, oh, Jennifer Coolidge was Ben Grimm. I am so excited to see where this goes. Because I think we're kind of in the coolidge sense right now. And I am here for it. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. I, for one, welcome this coolidge sense. <laughs> I have a feeling our pitches are going to be kind of similar, which I'm actually very excited for. But with my cast, I kind of had to, well, I've taken many turns. This list changed a handful of times. And knowing that I can't cast Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara as Reed or Sue, I had to get creative. So the only repeat from your list is Christopher Guest, who I have cast as my Reed Richards for similar reasons that I've mentioned before. He's a chameleon. I think he can do whatever he wants to. And I think certainly he fits the mold of being, he can play snarky, arrogant, intelligent, fatherly, all all the things that make Reed Richards Reed Richards. I have faith that Christopher Guest can do it. The next one, Sue Storm, is probably the biggest name on my cast, and that is the immaculate Jane Lynch. I love her in almost everything she does. And to see her be a badass superhero, I'd love to see it. I mean, currently, I think she's uh, hosting Weakest Link. I kind of want to see, like, snarky, mean Sue Storm. (laughs) I think that it would be a waste opportunity if you don't have her say, and that's how Sue sees it, uh, as a reference to her character, Sue Sylvester in Glee. Oh my god, I am so mad I didn't make that connection. That that is why you are now the co-host, Jack. That's why I'm here. For For stuff like this, to make the connections that I missed. 
hey, maybe she's just Sue Sylvester. She just she just changes her name to Storm. <laughs> that oh, that would be a great twist. Are you kidding? <laughs> so the next two are very much oh that guys like people you don't know their names but you've seen them in a thousand different things uh so for my johnny storm i cast ed begley jr again tall blonde older actor been in tons of comedies and again just one of those oh that guy so i'm not going to expand too much and the same with ben Grimm. Uh, i'm casting paul dooley who in a lot of the films that he's been in and guest, he's kind of this sad sack. He's kind of like a, an old man droopy dog. And, you know, I feel like that if that doesn't describe Ben Grimm, I don't know what does. Minus, you know, the whole rock facade. Finally, the next, I'd say, biggest name on my cast is Dr. Doom. And I'm casting the great Michael McKeon. I was a little nervous at first casting him in a villain role. He's been pl he's played kind of these snarky people, but really after seeing him in Better Call Saul, where some may argue if he's a villain or not, he can certainly play an antagonist. He's excellent on Better Call Saul. To be fair, I don't necessarily see Doom being an antagonist in my movie. I actually kind of don't see the Fantastic Four and him being the biggest part of my movie. They are the impetus for the film. I would not say they are what drives the film, though. As we mentioned before, Christopher Guest has a large ensemble that he's worked with. That may come up in my pitch. Who knows? We will find out soon. Yeah, that is my cast. I think Michael McKeon would do a great job in any role you ask him to do. He's hilarious. He's dramatic. He can read the phone book and make it sound interesting. I'm very excited to hear your pitch now. I hope it lives up to it. Again, I know that you said that you think we might have similar pitches. Hearing yours now, I I don't think we do anymore, Dan. Good, I guess. You know, like great minds think alike or great minds have their own ideas, however you want to look at it. We'll see. Yep. All right. Well, with our films now cast, it is time to pitch our Christopher Guest Helmed Fantastic Four films. But before we get into those pitches, I do have two questions for us. First, is yours an origin film? Mine is not. Mine is very much not. Secondly, is it part of the MCU? Yes, it is. Mine is too. So I, I am even more excited to see where these go. So Jack, let's go ahead with your Christopher Guest Fantastic Four pitch. All right, here we go. The year is 2060. Although the world has changed in many ways, shapes, and forms, one thing has remained consistent. Rogers the Musical has been a Broadway sensation, and just this past week, it celebrated becoming the longest-running show in the history of the Great White Way, beating out Phantom of the Opera's 13,925 performances. Now, while many see this as an achievement, the members of the Fantastic Four are less than happy about this, because they feel as though the Avengers are overshadowing their achievements as a team. Reed and Sue have recently decided to hire documentarian Victor Von Doom to make a film about them as doom explains i guess i have used to be an enemy of the uh fantastic four that was a really long time ago in my life and it's a part of me that i've been trying to uh trying to put behind myself in my old age i have become intensely fascinated with the works of the great documentarians moore herzog burns questlove and when you know when Reed approached me to ask if I would consider making a documentary <clears throat> about the about the Fantastic Four, I thought, well, that might just be what I need. Reed and Sue tell the audience that they are planning on writing their own musical to open on Broadway that they believe will be a worthy competitor to Rogers. Reed tells the camera that he uh, used to do a fair amount of writing in my downtime. Now, that was mostly equations, figuring out the secrets of the universe, but I really always had a passion for music. At this point, we'll show pictures of young Reed sitting at a piano or writing in, in a notebook titled Music Ideas. Young Reed will, of course, be Dan Levy. And, you know, I met Sue here at a, at a karaoke bar. Uh, I had just ordered a drink when I heard an angelic voice come across the speakers. I turn around and I see an even more beautiful woman singing it. Pen over to Sue. The song was Love Shack by B-52, also our wedding song. Reed and Sue show Victor around their Baxter Building penthouse, introducing him to Johnny, Sue's brother. However, they are careful not to mention the musical, letting Johnny believe that this is simply a documentary that is about superheroes in their post-hero life. 
As they lead Victor away, they explain that John is a bit of a diva, especially when it comes to the theater. If he hears about this, he'll want to be in it, but he uh, can't really carry a tune. Finally, they introduce Victor to Ben Grimm, who is actually just Jennifer Coolidge, but she looks the same in 2060 as she does currently. In an interview with her, she explains, uh, Yes, I am approaching 99, but... Well, it's interesting. After I blipped and realized I didn't age, I asked my people if they would get in touch with, um... Oh, what's the guy's name? You know, the purple one. Thanos? Yes, uh, Thanos, that's right. And I had them ask if he would just make it so that I didn't age like I did when I was dead. But it seemed that he had died too, which was very sad, so I just decided to figure it out for myself. Turns out it's a mix of, um, sunbathing two hours a day. Uh, a very specific kind of skincare lotion, and an Emmy. Yeah, you know, the passing on Ben was, uh, really hard on all of us, Reed says, at which point we will see a cameo that shows the late Fred Willard as the thing in picture form. But, you know, we couldn't be the... <laughs> we couldn't be the Fantastic Three, so we put out a Twitter open call that we were looking for a new member. Well... You wouldn't believe the responses we got. It was a tricky process, to be sure. But, you know, when we saw Jennifer, we thought, that's it. That's our Ben. It was like he had been reincarnated inside of her, and his essence was spewing out of her mouth. Now, the majority of the film then shows Reed and Sue writing the musical, running it over with Jennifer and Victor. At a certain point, Victor sets his camera down and asks Reed if there's by chance a part for him in the musical. It can be anything, I just think that performance is the natural next step in my evolution. Reed agrees to let him play Johnny Storm. When Von Doom is rehearsing, the real Johnny overhears him and thinks that the character he is singing about sounds a lot like a certain hothead I know. Johnny goes to Reed and demands to know what's going on. Reed tells him that it's a musical, and Johnny demands a part, trying to prove to Reed that he can sing, but of course he can't. However, Reed feels too bad for Johnny to tell him the truth, and agrees to let him play the role of concerned civilian. Well, does it have any solos? You know, Johnny, there are no small parts. <laughs> Only small actors, right? Johnny agrees to fully commit himself to the character of concerned civilian. Sue secures the theater for the musical to take place at, but is growing increasingly worried about the team. Reed is micromanaging every piece of production. Johnny is trying to make his part more and more bombastic. Victor is caught in between being the documentarian and being Johnny in the play. Uh, the only one who seems to be nailing the part is Jennifer, she says. Yeah, that comes with the experience, I think. When I was doing my part in the road chip, I was required to walk around on my knees so that I could be closer to the height of the chipmunks. But they told everybody else that was on the set to just walk around normally. So I'm on my knees scooting around the floor and I hear the director call out, She's not low enough! So they have me get on all fours and before I know it, I think I'm playing a dog. So yeah, I would say this is easier than that. Eventually, we make it to opening night. Victor has set up cameras all around the theater to capture everything, but he worries still about his part. Eventually, he gets cold feet and tells Johnny that it's gotta be him. The show goes on with Johnny now playing Johnny. The musical receives a standing ovation, and the Fantastic Four come out together to take a bow. Cut to six months later, Von Doom says that he didn't expect the show to go well, and that it made for a worse documentary, but that he thinks he'll still submit it to Sundance. They, li they like uplifting stories there, don't they? Reed says that the musical ended up closing after four months because it was incredibly expensive to produce, like, big oversight on my part, but that Jennifer Coolidge did end up winning the Tony. She says this now makes her a Bogota, which she says is a BAFTA, Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony, and AARP Movie for Grown Ups Award. Johnny has left the theater behind for good and is now working as an intern for the New York Fire Department. As for Sue, she's just glad that people remembered the Fantastic Four however briefly and that's my pitch fuck you <laughs> god oh man man that was so good uh, and i'm going to be thinking about that one for a long time it i think what really did it was the bagoda <laughs> <laughs> I thought of that this morning, and I was uh, like, I gotta put that in there. Uh, the AARP movie f movie for adults, or it's the AARP movie for grown up award for grown up award. <laughs> but wonderful use of Jennifer Coolidge lived up to my anticipation when you said she was going to be Ben Grimm. And 
I don't know if there's a better compliment. That sounds like it would be a Christopher Guest movie if he did this. Mm -hmm. um, I hope mine lives up to this. I this I hate doing this. Like I like I'm like I go in oh my pitch I I like my pitch and then like my guest and Jack are just like oh let's kick kick me while I'm down you know. <laughs> no, Man. I'm sure your pitch is great. I'm very excited to hear it. So I will say, I went very much into or embrace the fact that like these actors will be improvising a lot of this stuff going forward. So this is very much going to be more of a feel than a full like rundown kind of like you had. But in a similar way, my movie is an audition. The Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom subsequently are retiring. They are in their old age, they're tired of doing this, and they're trying to find who the next team is going to be that will replace them. And They've all just kind of gotten old and crotchety in their old age. So the movie starts, they're sitting in this room. It kind of looks like a casting room for like a movie production. First, you have, I will say, they are cameos from Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara as Kazar and Shauna O'Hara. However, they are not actually Kazar and Shauna O'Hara. They are Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara saying, uh, yeah, I'm not going to do the impression because um, I feel like I'm going to sound too much like Jimmy Stewart if I try. Um, anyway, they're like, yeah, we're uh, running out of roles for uh, Marvel. Um, so we and you have Eugene Levy like in the loincloth, Catherine O'Hara in like the the cloth uh, bra and just again, loincloth. And they bring in their own tiger too as well. It's like, so they're, they're pulling out all the stops and you just see crotchety Paul Dooley as Ben Grimm's like, next. And this is where that was kind of the cold open for the film. The movie then transitions to the Great Lakes and we see that the title card say the Great Lakes Avengers. And for those of you who don't know, it is an offset of the Avengers that protect the Great Lakes. And they get the call that the Avengers are looking for someone to take their place. It's like, this is our chance. Everyone looked down on us, made fun of us. We are the Great Lakes Avengers and we are going to show them what we're made of. And the Great Lakes Avengers are made of Big Bertha, who will be played by the aforementioned Jennifer Coolidge, Dinah Soar, played by Rachel Harris, who's had some small parts in Christopher Guest's films. If you don't know who she is or can't recall, because most of these people are, oh, that's who that is. Uh, she played Ed Helms' Beyonce in The Hangover, is probably what most people might remember her by. She's also uh, Angela's sister on The Office. Oh, yes, yes. We're going to have Flat Man, played by Bob Balaban, which seemed very fitting. A squirrel Girl, played by Parker Posey. Doorman, played by Harry Shearer. And Grasshopper, played by Don Lake. Though the two kind of main forces that you're going to be seeing on camera a lot will be Jennifer Coolidge and Parker Posey. And th this whole journey, what's being documented is their trip to New York for the audition. They're all very excited by all these mishaps, like their, their transportation breaks down. They get robbed, which is not a great sign for heroes who are trying to, you know, show what they're made of to get robbed. And this whole time you see... Parker Posey just harassing the others with squirrels because she's just not, she doesn't want to be there. She just, she has superpowers and it's talking and controlling squirrels. She just uses it to torment everyone in Parker Posey fashion. You have Jennifer Coolidge being her bubbly yet kind of airy self as, as Big Bertha. So really that is, it is their journey and their trials and tribulations from the Great Lakes to New York. Throughout this, we kind of intercut between their journey versus more uh, scenes of auditions to be the Fantastic Four. You have Larry Miller come as the Armadillo, and the Armadillo, uh, also named Antonio Rodriguez in Marvel, probably wouldn't be in this version, but essentially he is a humanoid Armadillo. Not much more I can say about that, I think. Ben Grimm looks, oh, you're interesting. And then he says something racist and gets cut. Then we have Will Sasso come in, who had a small part in Best in Show. He helped run Christopher Guest's character's bait shop. And uh, he comes in as Archon the Magnificent, kind of like this Conan the Barbarian type. And they realize it's all fake muscle. Like he's very steroided up. He's, he's more bulk than actual strength. So he gets cut. 
Then you have John Michael Higgins and Michael Hitchcock come in as 3D man. So it's just half of each of their body is one person. I don't know 3D man's actual powers. I forgot to look it up, but I real I'm going to just say their power is just being half like two halves of one person combined and they're just talking over each other the whole time, which gets them cut. And then finally you have Craig Bierko come in as Howard the Duck. I know Howard the Duck has been in the MCU before, but this one I'm going to recast and have Craig Bierko, who probably most notably has been in Cinderella Man. He played Max Bayer, the final fight that Russell Crowe's character had. He will be Howard the Duck. And he has a decent interview, very charismatic, but they ask like, so besides being, you know, a humanoid duck, can you do anything else? Nah. So he gets cut. This is all to say that come the end of the film, they really haven't found anyone and they close off the Baxter building or what you think is the Baxter building just as the Great Lakes Avengers come in and it says a sign saying position filled and we pan to a different room where we see the young Avengers come in. We have those who we've seen in the MCU before, Elijah Richardson playing the Patriot or Eli Bradley. Uh, we see Haley Steinfeld as Hawkeye, Kate Bishop, uh, Catherine Newton playing Stature, Cassie Lang, Sochil Gomez playing uh, America Chavez. And then we're going to get some guest reoccurrences in some later films, be some other young Avengers. So two actors from the movie Mascots, that was a Netflix film that he directed, which is a mockumentary about mascots. We're going to have Hulkling and Wiccan played respectively by Chris O'Dowd and Zach Woods. If I can cast Zach Woods in something, I'm going to. And I think he kind of has the look of the young kid. If you saw the kid who played one as Billy, who is presumably going to be Wiccan eventually in the MCU, I could see him growing up into what Zach Woods might look like. And then finally, we are going to see Iron Lad walk in. Nathaniel Richards played by someone who had a small role in For Your Consideration. John Krasinski walk in as Nathaniel Richards, aka Iron Lad, as the leader of the Young Avengers. But he says, okay, okay, you've all had your fun. And this is where the twist is. He starts him, the other Young Avengers, and some orderlies start wheeling out the rest of the Avengers to bring them to the old people's home for superheroes. This was all just a ruse to get them because their minds have started to go. And some dementias kicked in. And they were just letting them play out this ruse about finding the next Fantastic Four because these young Avengers have already taken over, led by Nathaniel Richards, Reed and Sue's son. However, in a mid credit scene, you're going to see Nathaniel Richards, John Krasinski walk out as the other young Avengers leave with his face flashing. And remember, this is probably way past Secret Wars and the Kang Dynasty, but you're going to see Jonathan Major's face kind of flash in and out from John Kaczynski's, because as you may or may not know, Nathaniel Richards is also Kang the Conqueror. Um, so that might be how that whole dynamic is introduced into the MCU. And in the sequel to the guest Fantastic Four, you're going to have the Young Avengers and the Great Lakes Avengers team up to bring down Kang the Conqueror, John Krasinski, Nathaniel Richards, who people wanted to be Reed Richards. And that is my... I and who was Reed Richards at a certain point. Right, in Multiverse of Madness. Uh, that was an excellent pitch. Thank you. I Thank you. would watch the shit out of it. Yeah, so like I said, it's I'm not, I'm not here to try and replicate the comedy of these people who are way funnier than I am. I just mm -hmm. wanted to give you the feel of what this film would be. I mean, if you've watched any of these movies, you kind of know the temperament and humor of these people and the crap and the hijinks that they'll get in. In their very, whether it's cameos, full full roles, and whatnot, especially like the original cast of Fantastic Four, just these old crotchety people. I do see Sue being kind of a Sue Sylvester in this case, mm -hmm. and all of them just being like old and tired. I do see like prosthetics. Not all of them are old enough to be, you know, in old people's homes, but I do see some prosthetics and some makeup being done to age them up some. For sure. Um, but that that is my pitch. There's some twists, some turns. Uh, hopefully some fun on-camera interviewing, some improvisation that, again, I'm not going to try and replicate. But yeah, 
I, I enjoyed it. I, I think you hit it out of the park, Jack. But I think you hit it out of the park, Dan. Well, thank you. This is just to say that if you haven't watched any of his movies, you really should. I know yeah. this is probably the least known director we've done on the show so far. Most likely, as you may have picked up on by this point, Dan and I are kind of taking directors that we love that we might not have a guest on for and doing episodes for them. Right. Just because we have such affinity for these director's films. Dan and I have fairly similar taste, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're just trying to highlight great directors that we think would make great movies. So if you haven't seen Christopher Guest movies, please go watch them. Go watch Spinal Tap. Go watch Princess Bride. He's great in that movie. He's just, he's a phenomenal director, phenomenal actor. Just go watch his movies. And I believe Waiting for Guffman is the easiest, most of easily available now, having just got on HBO Max. It is so, on HBO Max. The others are on Showtime, I believe. So you'll probably have to rent those one way or the other. Rent those, or you can get it through Paramount+. Plus. Right. But with that said, that is our castings, our pitches for Christopher Guest Fantastic Four film. We hope you, the listeners, enjoyed our exploration into this what-if scenario. We want to make special note that the Fancast It For podcast is hosted for free on Anchor. And we encourage you, if you have your own podcast idea, to check out Anchor. It really is a great resource for getting your idea off the ground. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. If you are listening on YouTube, we would greatly appreciate you hitting that subscribe button and commenting with who your Christopher Guest cast would be on what your thought of our lists and pitches were and on which director you'd want to see next. I want to thank Matt Hart and our previous guest, Maddie Gunner, for the fantastic theme music they created for us. But I also want to make a side note. As of this recording, yesterday was National Coming Out Day. And a year ago from that day, I came out as bi. I'm not going to go into this whole story, but I do want to say if it weren't for that decision to, to come out like I had, this podcast probably wasn't going to be possible. The emotional weight that came from letting the world know who I am gave me the energy, the motivation to take this idea that I've had for a few years and finally make it a reality. And for that, I just want to say if it's something you're struggling with or it's not just your timeline or time to come out, that's fine. But I just want to let you know that there's so many added benefits to doing it when you're ready on your own time. The community is truly a wonderful resource. I have found solace in fellow members of it. I am also openly uh, gay. And again, it's something that you figure out on your own time. It's something that you, you just know that if you are feeling any sort of feelings regarding it, never hesitate to talk about them. They are important. They're valued. You are important. You are valued. And while this is one of the few times we've talked about it. It's not something Jack and I advertise on the podcast all the time. I am very proud that this, this podcast is run by two members of the LGBTQ community. It's something As that uh, needs to be promoted more. And if you are an LGBTQ person looking to create your own content and don't know where to start, my messages are open. Don't hesitate to reach out. Personal Twitter. Mine. Personal Twitter's at dhouse77, or if you want to reach out to at the fancast at four, that works just as well. That is our show. Thank you all so much for listening. I'm Dan Bettenhausen. And I'm Jack Mayer. And we hope you all have a fantastic day.